on. Does, should it not have a little button? <laughs> Oh, here. Okay. All right. I apologize. Thank you. I began by uh, saying good afternoon and telling everyone what an honor and privilege it has been to serve as the commissioner of this public inquiry. Yesterday, I delivered my final report and recommendations to the Government of Ontario. And today, through this event and proceedings, I released the report and recommendations to the people of Ontario. This report is the result of intensive work over the past two years by a dedicated commission team and the input and assistance of a great many people, far too numerous to identify by name today, but many of whom I see in the audience. I would ask and invite you all to look at the acknowledgements at the beginning of volume two, in which I recognize and thank you the many people and organizations who have contributed to the work of this inquiry. A copy of my remarks today and the full report will be available on the inquiry website in both French and English shortly after I conclude these remarks. I anticipate that my remarks will take approximately a half an hour. I've been working on trying to keep them down to no more than 40 minutes, so bear with me. I can tell you that the remarks that are on the website will be fuller uh, than what's here, what I deliver today, uh, simply because of the interest of time. My goal in my remarks today is to focus on the recommendations, but before I discuss the recommendations, there are a few foundational points that I'd like to make. The first is, and I know this is going to seem very much like a lawyer with her exhibits at trial. But I hope that this report becomes a reference point for all the long-term care homes in Ontario. And like most people, I think we deal with paper more than lengthy documents on, uh, the, uh, on the web. So what I'd just like to do is to talk to you about how the report works. So volume one is um, the executive summary and consolidated recommendations. So if you look at that document, what you'll see, for example, at the back is a simple listing of all the recommendations that we make. So if you look, for example, I've got this one, 62, chapter 15, building capacity and excellence in the long-term care home system. If you're interested in that particular recommendation, look for chapter 15, which is in volume three, because what happens w when you go to the actual volume is that there's the same recommendation, but now there are details, details about how you can implement it. And furthermore, behind that is a listing of the rationale. Because if we understand why you made a recommendation, it resonates in a different way. So that's an important tool that I'd like to share with you. And there's a couple of other points that are minor in relation to it, but again, because I do hope that these uh, reports are used, it may be helpful. So as I said, we start with the uh, executive summary. Volume two. <laughs> Sorry, massive, I know. It's the best uh, summary that we have of all the work that we did in the investigations. If you are a stakeholder in the long-term care system, a major stakeholder, you are addressed in this document. Um, you will see the results, the summaries of the recommendations, and you will see the full-out rec uh, recommendations with rationale and detail. I'm not going to say anything more today about this because this basically was the work that we did in the public hearings, but I do um, encourage you to look at it if you're a stakeholder for that reason. If I haven't mentioned by the end of this week, in other words, as soon as I get back into the office on, tomorrow, we will be sending out a hard copy of this report to every single long-term care home in the uh, province, all 626 of them. And the last thing that I would uh, draw to your attention is volume four. 
Process is important. When I was a young law student, all I wanted to do was work with people. I didn't understand how important process and procedure was. It's vital. If you're going to find out what's really happening, you need to have a proper process. That's what this volume does. I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but if you have any doubts about whether we properly con consulted with people, whether we had experts, whether we had research, whether we did road shows, whether we met with people, you look at, uh, at this. So that's the first thing by way of a foundational point that I'd like to talk about. Um, the inquiry process, two points. To develop effective recommendations on how to avoid similar tragedies to those terrible offenses which Wetlawfer committed, I needed two things. I needed a full factual understanding of the offenses and the circumstances that allowed them to be committed. I needed to understand the long-term care system and I needed to understand the roles played by the major stakeholders in that system. That was what we did in part one. That's what's in volume two. The other thing I did need, however, was different. I needed research. What has happened in this relationship in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world. I needed the advice of experts. And I needed, most of all probably, extensive consultations with those who work in the long-term care home system to determine what is actually can be done, what actually is workable. So part two of the inquiry process fulfilled that need, and that's in, in volume four. No more on either of those things. The next foundational point, though, I would like to talk to you about is what I call debunking myths. Over the course of the last two years, I've heard four repeated urban myths. I don't have a better word for them. Things that people think are true and they are not true. And we need, if we're going to really understand these recommendations, we need to have a shared understanding of these things. These things are not true. First myth, the offenses were mercy killings. I have heard that repeatedly. And that is just not true. When Wentlofer committed the offenses, the victims were still enjoying their lives and their loved ones were enjoying time with them. It was not mercy to harm or kill these people. And in fact, Whitlefford herself never ever claimed that she acted out of mercy. She said she committed the offenses because she was angry about her career, her responsibilities, her life. And she said that after she killed or harmed, she felt a release a sense of euphoria. That's her word, euphoria. And what that tells you, every one of us in this room and beyond, is that Weltlofer is a serial killer. People do kill for other reasons. Greed, anger, jealousy, and so on. Not this kind. This is serial killing. Like other serial killers, Wetlawfer committed the offenses for her own gratification and for no other reason. It was not mercy to harm those people. That's the first myth. Here's another myth that I heard often. The, the, the difficulties facing the long-term care system, there are issues that are baby boomer generation. Just relax when baby boomers, that includes me, when we pass, all the problems will be gone. <laughs> yep. Now, of course it is true that the baby boomers, including me, everybody born between 1946 and 1965, it is true that part of the bulge in the uh, older uh, population, segment of the population in Ontario, part of the graying is because of the baby boomers. But that is not the reason that there are challenges facing the long-term care home system. There are two reasons why you can't just pass this off as a baby boomer issue. First one, we've had low birth rates in Canada and in Ontario since the 1970s. That means we're having less babies born, which means naturally you're going to start to have uh, more older uh, people in terms of your population. But the other thing, which is a wonderful thing, is that we have an increasing life expectancy. We're all going to live longer. 
So the trend of older people making up a significant proportion of the overall population of Ontario is going to continue long after the baby boomer generation has passed. But the other thing to recognize is that the challenges that Ontario's long-term care system is facing is not just because of the sheer number of older Ontarians. The fact of the matter is that the increased challenges are also a function of the rising acuity of older uh, members of Ontario society. Acuity just means the level of care we need. As we live longer, our later years are usually accompanied by cognitive and physical impairment. That's just a fact of life. We get older, we have more needs. Formal word, higher acuity levels. But whether you are fortunate enough to live at home as you age, or you are a resident in a long-term care home because your needs are such that you need 24-hour care, it doesn't matter where we age. As acuity levels rise, as our life expectancy extends, and acuity levels increase, so do the workloads of those who provide care and support for an aging population. That's the challenge in the long-term uh, care uh, system, and that's not a baby boomer problem. So that's the second myth. Another myth, wet lawfers in jail, threats passed. Basically, I did get asked this often, why are we having an inquiry? She's in jail, she can't hurt us anymore. That's true, wet lawfer can't hurt us anymore, she's in jail. It is not true to say that because she is in jail, the threat that she poses has passed. Wet lawfer is a healthcare serial killer. A growing body of research and literature shows that healthcare serial killing is a phenomenon. It's rare, but it is very long standing. We have have uh, documented cases dating back to the early 1800s, and it is widespread in its reach. In light of the healthcare serial killer phenomenon, we cannot simply assume that because wet lawfer is behind bars, the threat to the safety and security of those receiving care in the long-term care system has passed. Expert evidence presented at the public hearings shows that since 1970, 90 healthcare serial killers have been convicted in the United States, Britain, Western European countries, and now because of wet lawfer, also in Canada. But it's also notable that during the inquiry, so it's run for two years, during the inquiry, the media has reported the arrests of two more alleged healthcare serial killers, one in England, one in Japan, and as many of you will have seen in the media reports, the continuing police investigations into convicted German healthcare serial killer Niels Hogel has revealed He's in, he's in jail in Germany for convicted of many uh, killings, but that he has killed at least another 100 people uh, than those for which he has been uh, convicted. Furthermore, the fact that serial killing by healthcare providers is rare does not mean that we could ignore its ex existence. While the known number of healthcare serial killers is very small, the number of their victims is not. The 90 convicted healthcare serial killers have been found guilty of murdering at least 450 people and convicted of assault or grave bodily injury of at least another 150. And the expert evidence, you can see it if you wish in the report, um, says that on best evidence, about 2,600 suspicious deaths are attributable to those 90 people. Myth number four, the harm caused by the offenses is limited to the victims and their loved ones. When people try to put the harm that the offenses created, the scope of the harm into context, they say, well, 14 offenses and their loved ones. That fundamentally misunderstands the harm, the nature and scope of the harm that these offenses have caused in Ontario. Yes, of course it's true that the victims and their loved ones are the people who suffered the most direct 
harm from the offenses. And the extent of their suffering is profound and it does continue to this day. But the harm caused by the offenses does not end with the victims and their loved ones. These offenses cause residents in long-term care homes to be fearful for their safety and their families share that fear. The people who work in long-term care have suffered too. They feel shame that a healthcare provider could do such a thing. And they feel guilt that they were unable to prevent it. And as well, for all the many fine people who work in long-term care and are committed to those for whom they provide care, these offenses have cast a terrible stain on them. The offenses have also shocked and horrified the members of the communities in which they took place, including here in Woodstock. But furthermore, these offenses shocked Ontario society as a whole. It was widely reported in the media that the offenses shook public confidence in Ontario's long-term care system, and we saw that repeatedly throughout the inquiry. People are truly worried about whether the long-term care system can safely provide care for their loved ones and indeed for themselves, for ourselves as we age. Widespread lack of trust and worry is a significant form of harm. So yes, the offenses are personal tragedies for the victims and their loved ones, but to suggest that the harm caused by the offenses is limited to them is to fundamentally misunderstand both the offenses and the scope of the harm that they caused. These offenses are tragedies of substantial public interest, and they demand our collective response if we are to prevent similar tragedies in the future. There's one more area that I'd like to talk to you about before I turn to the recommendations, and those are my principal findings. The findings really informed the direction of the recommendations, so let me share them with you. First of all, there would have been no knowledge of these offenses without Wetlawfer's confession. That's a really important finding. We would not have discovered these offenses if Wetlawfer had not confessed and turned herself into the police. She committed the offenses over a nine year period between 2007 and 2016. In September of 2016, when Wetlawfer took herself to CAMH in Toronto, and confessed to the treating psychiatrist that she had harmed and killed residents for whom she was providing nursing care. She was not under suspicion, she was not under investigation, and not a single one of the offenses that she committed was under suspicion or under investigation. We would not have known about them, period, had she not confessed. So what's the significance of that finding? It's this, if we're going to prevent similar tragedies in the future, we cannot continue to do the same things in the same ways in the long-term care system. We cannot. If the system didn't detect it before, it will not detect, deter, and stop it in the future. Fundamental changes must be made, changes that are directed at preventing, deterring, and detecting wrongdoing of the sort that Wetlawfer committed. So that's the first thing we need to understand. We would not have known of these offenses had she not confessed. The second one is this. As commissioner, I have the power to make findings of misconduct. As you will see in the report, I do not make findings of individual misconduct. And that is because, in my view, the offenses were the result of systemic vulnerabilities in the long-term care system and not the failures of any individual or organization within it. It appears that no one in the long-term care system conceived of the possibility that a health care provider would intentionally harm those within their care. If you don't conceive of the possibility, you don't look for it and you don't take steps to prevent it. You're just not aware that it's possible. You have to look at the report to see the whole system of evidence that I considered in determining that it was systemic vulnerabilities, not individual failings, that created the circumstances that allowed these offenses to be committed. It, 
it's so hard to describe what you mean by systemic vulnerabilities. But the long-term care system is, is made up of so many different pieces. And no one in that system was alert to the possibility that there could be intentional harm. And so you have vulnerabilities throughout the system that need to be addressed. Because the system itself has the vulnerabilities and the shortcomings, it would be very unfair in my view to make findings of individual misconduct because the individual findings of misconduct suggest that those individuals or organizations are at fault. So I can't both come to the determination that the system failed in various ways and point my finger at someone. It, that, that's logically inconsistent, but it's also counterproductive. If what's happened is we have found systemic vulnerabilities that need to be fixed, if you point your finger at someone, what happens is everybody else can give a big sigh of relief. Ah, oh, there's the problem. And, and so it's counterproductive to make findings of individual misconduct. Assigning blame to individuals does not remedy systemic deficiencies or problems. It does not guard against similar tragedies. And most of all, it does not encourage the people in the long-term system to collectively say, we have to work together to address this. This is a common problem. We need to work together, not in silos, but collectively. So this finding is significant because it tells us there's no simple fix to avoiding similar tragedies in the future. Systemic issues demand systemic responses. Systemic responses require collaboration, cooperation, and communication throughout the system. And I thought I'd share with you just one simple fix, which I, at the beginning of the inquiry, thought was genius, and I would love to be able to hold it up. But it's an example of when I say, we, it's not that easy, folks. We just don't have a simple fix. It was a suggestion that I heard repeatedly, and that is when a resident passes in long-term care, take a sample of their blood, all of them, and if we find excess levels of insulin, let's take a look, see if there's intentional harm. Somebody intentionally gave them an overdose. To me, that, as I said, was a genius um, suggestion. But investigation shows that's not so. Dr. Michael Polanin is the chief forensic pathologist for Ontario. He is a recognized world expert as a forensic pathologist. He was the forensic pathologist who gave uh, expert evidence at the criminal proceedings for against Wetlawfer, and he has uh, worked with us and given us his expert advice. And he says that this cannot be done. If you want to find out why, look at chapter 19 in volume three. I've got all the scientific and medical explanation there. But he says it cannot be done. It cannot be done. And he said, even if we surmount all of the financial and other hurdles that are involved in doing that, it is of, quote, little or no use in detecting whether there had been an intentional administration of an insulin overdose. So the consequence of my saying I made a finding of, of uh, I made no findings of individual misconduct is this. It is systemic vulnerabilities that allowed, that created the circumstances that allowed wet lawfer to commit these offenses. And it is gonna take a collective systemic response to, to remedy it. There is no quick fix. The last finding that I made is that the long-term system is strained but not broken. And this is what I mean by that. The long-term care homes are the most highly regulated area of health care in Ontario. And despite the limited resources, the staff in the homes have to meet all those regulatory dictates and provide care for residents with ever-increasing acuity, ever-increasing levels of need. That is creating strains in the long-term care home system. There's no question about it. But it is not broken. Because to me, this is the question. Is it broken? The question is, do we have to throw out the regulatory framework that now exists? 
And the answer is no. The Long-Term Care Homes Act 2007 and its regulations creates a resident-centered framework that imposes clear minimum standards of care on a broad range of matters and a rigorous inspection regime to enforce those standards. There is no need to throw that uh, system out. What we do need to do, two things. We need to spread and share the existing excellence in the long-term care system, but secondly, we need to acknowledge the vulnerabilities in the system that this inquiry has exposed, and we need to address them by implementing the recommendations in this report. And that takes me to what I really want to talk to you about today, which is the recommendations. There are 91 recommendations in the report, and I would completely understand if you were to say to me something like, Commissioner Gleese, I have no idea how to approach so many recommendations, so wide-ranging in scope, so widely divergent. How do they fit together, if at all? What's the most important? How do we approach this? The answer to this question are the initials P-A-D-D, PAD, Prevention, Awareness, Deterrence, and Detection. What's our goal with this inquiry? The goal is to create re uh, recommendations that will avoid offenses like wet lawfare uh, committed, right? That's our goal. We need strategies to get th to that goal, to achieve that goal. We got four strategies. We have prevention, awareness, deterrence, and detection. Those are the organizing tools. Once you see that virtually all of the recommendations are directed at one of those things, prevention, awareness, deterrence, or detection, you'll get it. The drivers are the systemic recommendations. So let me start. Tell me if you lose me. I just need to put this book down a little bit. OK, at the back? <coughs> prevention. OK, volume three. Volume three is called a strategy for uh, safety. Volume three is um, the systemic issues, okay? Each chapter in volume three takes one of those topics, prevention, awareness, deterrence, and detection. It tells you what are the systemic vulnerabilities, and then it tells you how to address it. So for example, prevention. Well, what are you talking about? Prevention. Well, we're talking about how can we best exclude people who want to harm from coming into the long-term care home system? How can we prevent it, in other words? Not just detect it, we want to prevent them from coming in. The answer to that is to strengthen the long-term care home system and to encourage excellence in resident care. So recommendation 62 is the systemic recommendation that is aimed at prevention. In it, I ask that the Ministry of Long-Term Care step out of its existing primary job, which is um, compliance and enforcement. That's important. You got to keep that. There's minimum standards in the legislation. We need to keep that. But we need something more. We need expanded leadership on the part of the ministry. And I recommend that they establish a dedicated unit to do that. And that dedicated unit is going to work with um, uh, long-term care homes that are struggling uh, to achieve regulatory compliance, but also spread best practices. There are lots of excellent practices that individual homes and individual communities are doing. We need to spread that. That's a new role, to support, educate, spread best practices. I also call in that same recommendation on the, uh, the ministry to expand, reintroduce, and provide bridging and laddering programs in long-term care homes. That's not just to increase the skills of the people who work uh, within the homes, we need to offer opportunities for advancement within long-term care so that we don't lose the good people that we've trained. We, re we build human resource capacity and we address the very real problem we have, which is a shortage of registered uh, staff. 
I also that same in that same recommendation I say ministry please step up to the table you need to encourage innovation and the use of new technologies technology is one of our biggest friends in terms of uh, addressing the threat posed by someone like wet lawfer encouraging innovation and the use of technologies in the long-term care system everybody knows it but we need leadership we need that leadership through the through the ministry behind that systemic recommendation, prevention, which I just described for you, behind that comes a whole series of individual recommendations for individual stakeholders. There's two reasons for this. Systemic recommendations take cooperation, collaboration, and so on. They're not going to happen overnight. So you, but there are lots of things that can be done in short order. So there are specific recommendations also aimed at prevention. Those are specific recommendations aimed at specific stakeholders. So that it's not enough, for example, for any individual stakeholder to look and say, oh, the, it's up to the ministry to do this. That it is. The ministry has a big leadership role. We talked about that. But there are a lot of things that each individual stakeholder can also do. In my remarks, particularly on the, the web, you'll see them when you look at our website. But let me just give you some examples. Specific recommendations to specific stakeholders that can be done now, that's within the power of the individual stakeholder to grab a hold of and deal with. So recommendation to long-term care homes that they strengthen their education and training requirements. We talk about that that they limit and improve the use of agency nurses, and we give them specific strategies on how to do that. Other recommendations to the ministry. Okay, so we've got a big, big systemic recommendation, but we have a whole bunch of individual recommendations to the ministry, which we hope that they put on the table and start looking at tomorrow. Ex example, expand the funding parameters of the nursing and personal care envelope. Recognize and reward long-term care homes that have made demonstrated improvements in the wellness and quality of life of the residents. Create a new permanent funding envelope to fund training and education in long-term care homes. Strengthen the education requirements relating to medical directors and nurse practitioners. Refine the LCIP, the Long-Term Care Home Quality Inspection Program, to better identify homes that are struggling to provide a safe and secure environment and use that LCIP information and data when they're establishing inspection priorities. Identify long-term care homes who've fallen below a level one performance for two consecutive quarters and help them to return to a level one classification. Where a licensee fails to report reasonable suspicions of negligence and abuse as required by section 24, doesn't matter what level uh, that uh, home has, the next RQI, the next resident quality inspection is gonna be an intensive one you have to report. Those are examples of specific recommendations that come right in behind the big broad heading of prevention. Next, so prevention, now on to awareness. It is not possible to detect or deter something unless you are aware that it exists. That is a clear lesson from this inquiry. They could not detect or deter wet lawfer when they never thought of the possibility that a healthcare worker might intentionally harm. It's not only our finding, there are public inquiries and review processes across the world that have looked at healthcare serial killing and they all say the exact same thing. We have to improve awareness of the fact that this is an actual threat. To avoid similar tragedies in the future, it is Critical that awareness is developed throughout the healthcare system of the possibility that a healthcare provider could intentionally harm those in their care. So I'm gonna to talk to you about that for a minute. But one of the things we don't want to do is sabotage the caring relationships that do exist, healthy caring relationships that exist by and large with between residents um, and, and their caregivers. And we address that. You don't start fear-mongering, building mistrust, and so on. What you do is you deal with it in a constructive way. 
When you look at uh, risk factors, you simply add in the risk factor that you have to check for the fact that uh, a medical incident, for example, that occurred might be the result of intentional harm. So in other words, in my view, we deal with it in a truly Canadian way. It's a risk. It's a known risk. We are not going to be hysterical about it. We are simply going to address this in a meaningful way and get on with it. Somebody has to take responsibility for the massive job of developing awareness in a positive, constructive way that I just described. The recommendations 64 through 73 provide a roadmap for building, developing, and maintaining that awareness in a positive way. I've recommended that, that the Office of the Chief Coroner and the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service lead this initiative, beginning with the creation of a strategic plan. Thereafter, it should conduct ongoing research to keep up to date on the healthcare serial killer phenomenon in other jurisdictions, and it should also provide standardized key information and support to all the organizations and institutions that deliver education and training to healthcare and allied service providers. Indeed, the recommendations include guidance to those organizations and institutions on how they can develop that necessary awareness without creating a climate of fear and mistrust. In the interest of time, I'm not going to do what I did for the other ones to say, what's the systemic issue we have? The systemic issue is we need to build awareness of the possibility of intentional harm right across the healthcare system. Just talk to you about the strategies for doing that. But again, right behind that are a whole series of specific recommendations that work in conjunction with it. So while we're working on the big thing, individual stakeholders can work on specific strategies and get going after it. The third in the letters, PAD, Prevention, Awareness, Deterrence. Deterrence is the subject matter of Chapter 17. Like many healthcare serial killers, Wet Lawford committed the offenses by injecting her victims with overdoses of insulin that she had diverted from their intended use. She diverted insulin within the home for legitimate reasons and used it to commit harm. The key to deterrence is to having the long-term care homes make changes to the medication management system to deter staff from diverting any medications and make it more likely that they will be caught if they do that. So systemic recommendations 74 through 85, a three-pronged approach to deterring wrongdoers from intentionally harming residents. First, there are a series of strategies for strengthening the medication management system in long-term care homes. Second, we need to improve medication incident analysis in long-term uh, care homes, including by establishing specific strategies for incidents relating to possible insulin overdoses. And third, we need to increase the number of registered staff in long-term care homes. So that's a three-pronged strategy on how to deter healthcare uh, workers from diverting medications for whatever reason and making it much more likely that if they do to divert those uh, medications that they will be caught and stopped. How am I doing on time? Um, two things if I can on this. That first prong uh, on this approach of deterrence calls for the ministry to establish a grant program to provide fundings to long-term care homes for infrastructure changes to increase visibility around medications and key locations in the home, to harness the power of technology in detecting medication diversion, improving the tracking and auditing, auditing of medications and reducing their stocks, and enabling pharmacists and pharmacy technicians to play an expanded role. There is ample evidence to support the fact that if these recommendations are put in place, there will be reduced stocks of medication, improved medication reconciliation, improved quality of resident care, fewer medication errors, improved e investigation into medication incidents, significant cost savings, and improved resident outcomes. 
Again, I won't uh, go into it today because of time, but there are specific recommendations that work directly in conjunction with the systemic recommendations that I've just described to you on deterrence. PAD, prevention, awareness, deterrence, detection. We're on to detection. Steps must be taken in Ontario to strengthen our death investigation process as it relates to residents in long-term care homes so that that death investigation process is better equipped to detect intentionally caused resident deaths. The systemic recommendations 86 through 89 that we make are a blueprint for the Office of the Chief Coroner and the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service to meaningfully increase the number of death investigation of residents using information from a redesigned institutional patient death record and the Ministry of Health's data analytics uh, model which predicts or shows which homes have higher levels of deaths than were expected. There are a large, large number of specific recommendations that can be implemented quickly to support the detection. I'm going to leave PAD now, but I can't quite finish my comments on recommendations at this point. There is a difference between the long-term care system and the long-term care homes system. Many of us age at home. We are fortunate to be able to do that more and more, even as our acuity levels rise, often because of the support of family members, but also there are publicly funded supports that come into homes to help us stay in our homes as we age. The publicly funded home care services are things like nursing, personal support, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. All these services assist aging Ontario um, citizens as well as others, allowing us to remain in our homes as long as possible. You have to remember that the last offense for which wet lawfer was convicted, she committed while she was providing nursing services in a private home. So the scope of my mandate was not limited to the offenses that were committed in long-term care homes. You have to think of the long-term care home system as a whole because aging and the need for support comes in the home as well as when we come to the point if it comes to it where our care needs are so extensive that our families, with, even with support in the communities, cannot provide that, that's when we have to move into long-term care homes. So there are parts of this report that are directed at how we can strengthen the safety of those members of our community who receive assistance in their home. So Chapter 8, uh, Recommendations 14 to 18, Chapter 12, uh, recommendations 32 to 39 contain the bulk of the recommendations directed at improving safety in the home care setting. Of necessity, when we talk about improved safety for those who are receiving publicly funded nursing services and other services in their home, it has to be a wholly different situation. Um, so the recommendations are different. They don't fall neatly within the PAD um, uh, descriptor. The recommendations are directed at service provider organizations and they call for increased training for management and staff, improved processes for reporting unusual incidents, and also recommendations that I've directed to the LINs. We understand that the LINs may be replaced by something, but of course we hope that successor organizations would also carefully pay attention to our recommendations, um, which talk about conducting audits and uh, helping to ensure that the proper uh, obligations in terms of hiring, screening, and training of staff before those people come into our homes. There are also uh, complementary recommendations in other chapters. So let me conclude with just a few final remarks. First, to the residents in Ontario's long-term care homes, I hope and trust that the report and recommendations will serve to better ensure your safety and security. Please know 
that when we developed these recommendations, we never lost sight of the fundamental principle that the long-term care homes are the real homes, the real homes of the residents, places in which they live with dignity and security, safety, and comfort. Second, a word to the victims and their families and loved ones. This report is dedicated to you. The dedication, excuse me, I'll just take your back. The dedication is um, at the beginning of both volumes one and two, and this is how it reads. This report is dedicated to the victims and their loved ones. Your pain, loss, and grief are not in vain. They serve as the catalyst for real and lasting improvements to the care and safety of all those in Ontario's long-term care system. Third, to all those who work in the long-term care system. Volume three, as I've said, is entitled A Strategy for Safety. Volume three is dedicated to the workers. It says this. Volume three is dedicated to the many nurses and other caregivers who perform their jobs in the long-term care system with great kindness and great skill. Our strategy for safety cannot succeed without your continued dedication to those in your care. In opening, in opening our eyes to the one nurse who harmed, we must not forget the work of the many who are a credit to their professions. I'll close by recalling the world's words of Pearl Buck, the author. She said this a long time ago. Our society must make it right and possible for older people not to fear the young or to be de deserted by them. For the test of a civilization is the way that it cares for its vulnerable members. I call upon the Ontario government and all stakeholders in the long-term care system to consider the recommendations in this report and to do their part in implementing them. If Ontario is to be measured, as Ms. Buck said, on how we care for our vulnerable members, then seize the opportunity presented by this report to become the acknowledged national leaders in caring for those in the long-term care system. I have one piece of housekeeping and then I will wrap up. The piece of housekeeping is thus. We are going to take a five minute break when I uh, finish my remarks. Carl is over there. For any of you who did not get a copy of volume one, which is the executive summary, we have some copies there for you. The washrooms are right across the hallway. And at the end of five minutes, Mark uh, will be taking questions and, and providing answers to questions by the media. You're welcome to attend for that if you wish. Um, and so my last thing is simply this, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming today, for your kind attention as I publicly release the final report of the public inquiry into the safety and security of residents in the long-term care home system. Thank you. And we have been listening to Ontario Court of Appeal Justice Eileen Galee. She was delivering, delivering her remarks after submitting the inquiry report into long-term care homes in Ontario and the case of Elizabeth Wetlaufer, Wetlaufer being a former nurse who is now in prison after being convicted of killing eight senior citizens who are under her care. We have much more coverage coming up. The news conference not completely done. We're going to take a quick break here and then come back to this breaking news story right here on CBC News Network. Stay with us.
Well, I want to show you what's happening right now in Woodstock, Ontario. This is where we were just listening to Justice Eileen Galiz as she delivered her remarks after submitting the inquiry report into long care care homes in Ontario in the case of Elizabeth Wetlofer. Now, we have to say that uh, there's now going to be a news conference following a quick break here. But uh, as we wait for that news conference begin to begin, rather, we want to bring in our own Megan Fitzpatrick. She has uh, been in a lockup this morning going over the report, has been watching alongside us this uh, past hour or so. So Megan, a, a long report here. Talk to us about some of the highlights that you've seen. Well, the inquiry was trying to answer two key questions, Michael. How did Wetlawford get away with murder for so long, undetected, and what can be done to prevent her crimes from happening again? Now, Justice Galise started her very lengthy report uh, by outlining three key findings as a result of the investigations that happened uh, during the inquiry process. She wrote that Wetlawford, had she not confessed to her crimes in 2016, she wouldn't have been caught. Uh, she does not assign any individual blame in this report, but rather rather highlights system vulnerabilities. She said it would be unfair and counterproductive to lay individual blame. She also says that the long-term care home in Ontario is strained, but that it's not broken. She says the Ontario government doesn't need to scrap it, the regulatory system, and start all over again, but they do need to acknowledge these weaknesses and then build on the strengths. And she says the way to do that is to implement the 91 recommendations that are contained in her report. And she splits up the recommendations into four themes prevention, awareness, detection, and deterrence. And they're aimed at various stakeholders, Michael, including the College of Nurses, the regulatory body, long-term care homes themselves in Ontario, and then also the government of Ontario. Um, and just a few examples of some of the recommendations she makes. Uh, she talks about how long-term care homes should have robust reference checks when they make new hiring decisions, how they need to increase their training and education. She calls on the Ontario government to create a plan and to raise awareness about health care serial killers. Uh, she talks about uh, the need for a study about staffing levels in long-term care homes. She wants that done by the government within a year and says if it determines there need to be more staff, that the government should fund that. I want to note two of her first recommendations in the report. She says she wants the government of Ontario to report one year from today on what recommendations they've acted on, and she wants the government of Ontario to fund counselling services for the victim's family and the surviving victim. There was an attempted murder charge that uh, Wetlawfer faced. That woman is still alive and she participated in the inquiry as well. Uh, Galise talks in the report, Michael, about how, of course, uh, there was a lot of pain and suffering and harm done to the families, but also to the broader community, that people in Ontario lost their trust, or, or they, their trust was shaken anyway in the long-term care system, and she hopes that this report will help restore that confidence. Yeah, hoping that it restores some confidence, as you say. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about the findings. Let's talk a little bit about the recommendations here. Oh, excuse me, I'm going to stop uh, one second, Megan. We'll get back to it. We want to go back to Woodstock, Ontario right now. This is where the co-lead commissioner of the inquiry into long-term care in the province of Ontario is going to take questions from reporters. Let us take a listen right now. Sure. Yeah. Well, yes, commissions of inquiry can't convict people of anything or find them guilty of anything. They can make recommendations about misconduct. This one is very different because the wrongdoer was convicted and is in jail before the inquiry started. Often there is an inquiry into something that happened, and uh, the commissioners do make findings of misconduct because there are people who may have done things which are criminally culpable or civilly culpable. The commissioner in this case uh, was in a situation where the wrongdoer is in jail. She came forward uh, for whatever reasons, confessed, was convicted. So that part was done. The inquiry, the investigations all led to conclusions, and the evidence uh, led the commissioner to the conclusions that, uh, as she said earlier, this is not a situation where you point fingers at anyone to say, well, had you not done this, this wouldn't have happened. That's not 
what she uncovered. What she uncovered was there are various failings throughout the system where you don't blame any one individual actor, any one individual institution, any one individual group of people or workers or, uh, or uh, regulatory agencies or government to say that had you not done this, had you not done that, uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, her view was uh, that no one was aware that there could be a healthcare serial killer among us. Raising awareness and dealing with these issues are uh, the way to deal with it. Dealing with the system as a whole is the way to deal with it. As the commissioner said, it is counterproductive to point fingers at any individual players in the system. Next question. It is disconcerting not just that she might still be out. The question is how, how concerning, and, uh, concerning was it to the commission that had she not come forward, she might still be out there. And uh, as the commissioner explained, it's not just her, there could be someone else out there. Uh, and uh, that is very disconcerting, that the system did not catch a killer, did not even suspect that there was a killer. The families are here thinking, and, and were before this happened, thinking that their loved ones had died of natural causes. That is very disconcerting in terms of, of what led the commissioner to, uh, to do what she did, uh, and uh, that is why she's... Uh, made these systemic recommendations. But I think it's important not, not, not to look at this one killer and name her. In fact, uh, the commissioner's insisted. We call this the long-term care inquiry report or the Galise report, not the Wetlawford report. She should not be given that recognition. Uh, it is not about a killer, uh, this individual killer. Uh, it is more about how the system failed in, in uh, catching. One follow-up question, sir. Uh, one follow-up question, sir. Um, I understand Wetlawford to two other assaults that she wasn't charged for. Was one of them Flores Beadle, and could you shed more light on oh, I, I can't shed any light on anything else that she confessed to. She was never charged. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, there, there is the decision of the commissioner about some request to reopen the inquiry, and uh, that decision speaks for itself. The commissioner's mandate was with res respect to the offenses for which she was convicted. Question at the back. Uh, wait for the microphone to come. <laughs> Has Wetlawford been made aware? We, yes, well, I, we certainly that's not our mandate. Any other questions? Uh, one, well, any, well, let's see if there are any more media questions or, okay, by all means. I think the, the answer to that question is best answered by the coroner's office, and uh, the chief coroner actually will be here with the ministers later on, uh, and he's, he's here. But I think the, the general proposition is this, uh, that the, the commissioner found was that the, the method of reporting deaths, 
by health care providers in the homes to the coroner's office was failing, is one of the systemic failures, and that uh, a better form of reporting is needed and more evidence is required and more consultations with the family members are required before a decision is made whether or not uh, to conduct a, a post-mortem investigation. So that, that's, that's all I can assist you with. Well, the question, the question is, is not, it wasn't just about insulin, it was about whose death. And, and that, uh, that is fair. Uh, the chief pathologist gave evidence on, on trying to track insulin right after death, uh, insulin overdoses, and found that that was not uh, a practically feasible uh, activity, let alone one that was affordable for, for every patient. However, how deaths are reported generally and suspicions around deaths uh, was a major issue because once upon a time, more deaths were, uh, more coroner reports were required in long-term care. One out of every 10 deaths were required to be uh, reported on. That system went. Uh, what's replaced it was found problematic, and now the commissioner has made re recommendations for a different evidence-based system on death reporting. Any other questions? Uh, any, any, any more media questions, first of all? Uh, yeah, we we yeah we only have about ten more minutes. Well, you have a question? You have to have a question. <laughs> no, no. If you don't have a question, so you are listening to um, yes. We celebrate them and we protect them. My mother died in an old folks home, or whatever you want to call it. Never once did I figure it was incompetence. And maybe it was. But what happened here in Woodstock, Ontario was disgusting. And all of you should be punished, one way, shape, or another. And some of you should go to jail. These people died. Uh, that is not a question, sir. And, uh, well, you're and in fact, we did and in fact, there are legal proceedings about people who have concerns out there, but that's not for me to comment on. Uh, this is a bigger problem for the entire system, and you heard what the commissioner had to say. All right, we'll take one more question, and hopefully a question. I'm just standing up because I'm an RN, and I work in stress care. Yes. Okay. Uh, please identify yourself and your okay. question. Anita Bartley. I was an RN on the retirement home side. And I resigned a year ago. I understand the family. I cry every time I hear them on the news. I was so careful in my job, I shook like a leaf every time I gave insulin because I didn't want to make a mistake. I, when we heard this, could not believe one of our workers could have done it. It horrified us because we consider ourselves family. They're my people. I took care of them and I love them. But now I've heard, since I've left, they're letting on the retirement home side, non-regulated care providers who are not even PSWs, give insulin. Oh, what? Yes, yes, I yes. Okay. So, if, if, this, if this is in regard to the long care term center, does it apply also to the retirement side, which is on the side that's all, always on the news? The I saw you guys all the time out there. The mandate and was, was long-term care. Was that the same as the retirement? Because we just walked no, through the door. It, it was not, but there are rules about, uh, under the Health Professions Act, about who can administer because what. Because those people... And, and that, that's the place where that should... Okay, well, I think I need to, to tell you. Yeah. Well, you'll have like the Minister research. of Health here later, and you'll have the I would like your research, please. Care. Because and I couldn't work under people giving insulin, and who's going to be responsible when they don't even know what the drugs are. Fair enough. Okay. And that's a question to ask of the ministers when they come here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, there are no more media questions. So uh, I will, uh, we will be leaving. Uh, we've completed our role in delivering this report. At this point, uh, we will be turning over uh, the room to uh, the various ministry folks. Uh, I think they may be up here in about 10 minutes. Uh, so we will 
clear out and uh, hopefully uh, you'll hear what they have to say. Thanks. And you have been listening to a news conference taking place in Woodstock, Ontario. This is the re following the release of a report into a long-term care. This was an inquiry following the conviction of Elizabeth Wetlofer, who was convicted of killing eight patients in her care. She uh, tried to kill others and no one noticed. Let's back up, though, and hear what the inquiry commissioner said about the crimes of Elizabeth Wetlofer, Eileen Galise presented her conclusions a short time ago. If we're going to prevent similar tragedies in the future, we cannot continue to do the same things in the same ways in the long-term care system. We cannot. If the system didn't detect it before, it will not detect, deter, and stop it in the future. Fundamental changes must be made, changes that are directed at preventing, deterring, and detecting wrongdoing of the sort that Wetlawfer committed. So that's the first thing we need to understand. We would not have known of these offenses had she not confessed. The second one is this. As Commissioner, I have the power to make findings of misconduct. As you will see in the report, I do not make findings of individual misconduct. And that is because, in my view, the offenses were the result of systemic vulnerabilities in the long-term care system. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick has the details of the report live from Woodstock, Ontario. So take us through the main points, Megan. Well, Andrew, this uh, report was two years in the making, and really it was seeking to answer two key questions. How did Wetlawfer get away with murder for so many years with no one noticing? And what can be done to prevent these kinds of crimes from happening again in the future? So to get to those answers, the inquiry did a number investi of investigations, and she presented in her report three key findings. She said, had Wetlawfer not confessed to her crimes, which she did in 2016, she would not have been caught. That uh, the crime were a result of system vulnerabilities. You heard her say that in the clip. She did not assign individual blame here in this report. And she also said that the long-term care system in Ontario is under pressure, that it's strained, but she emphasized that it's not broken. She said the government of Ontario needs to recognize those vulnerabilities, but then build on the system's strengths. And to do that, she wants them to implement the 91 recommendations in her report, which she did split up into four kind of themes. And you heard her mention some of them there prevention, awareness, detection, and deterrence. The recommendations were aimed at a number of stakeholders, many of them uh, to the Government of Ontario, Andrew, but also to the College of Nurses and to long-term care homes uh, in general. Some of the recommendations included things like telling long-term care homes to do robust reference checks when they're hiring nurses, uh, to do more training and education about their obligations. She encouraged the government to create create a plan about the awareness of health care serial killers. She writes in her report that the public is safe from Elizabeth Wetlawfer, but that there is still a potential threat from these kinds of serial killers. She encourages the government to do a study about staffing in long-term care homes within one year, and if it determines that more staff are needed in these homes and the government should pay for it, she says. She also encourages the government to set up a fund where long-term care homes can apply for grants and make infrastructure changes around their medication rooms, putting in glass doors and windows, for example. But I think two of her uh, first recommendations in the report are important as well. She wants the government of Ontario to report back one year from today on what recommendations they've implemented, and she also wants free counselling provided for the victims' families for the next two years, starting now. She talked in the report about the harm that they have suffered personally, but also the harm done to the wider community by Elizabeth Wetlawfer and her crimes. Here's Justice Galise on that. Yes, the offenses are personal tragedies for the victims and their loved ones, but to suggest that the harm caused by the offenses is limited to them is to fundamentally misunderstand both the offenses and the scope of the harm that they caused. These offenses are tragedies of substantial public interest, and they demand our collective response if we are to prevent similar tragedies in the future. 
So she said she's hoping this inquiry, its recommendations, Andrew, will help restore that public confidence. We will be speaking to families. Many of them are here uh, today uh, to witness the release of the report, and we'll be asking them if they are satisfied with this report and if it will help them in their healing process. And Megan, we've already heard some emotion from uh, you know some people, some, from some families, but also from. Um, some healthcare workers who are horrified that somebody could have done this in their profession. What's the what is the cost of all this? Well, Justice Galise addresses that in her report as well, saying, yeah, these are a lot of recommendations here, but many of them would cost nothing or very little. She says those that would cost money, that they would be worth it. She says um, that they would be justified because these recommendations would not only improve the safety and security of long-term care residents, uh, but also their quality of life. One of her recommendations was for the government to uh, financially reward long-term care homes that improve the quality of life of their residents. And she said, collectively as a society, we need to reflect on the quality of life of residents, whether um, we want to, is this what we want to invest in? And of course, her view is that it should be invested in, that as a society, uh, we need to reflect on how long-term care homes are supposed to be homes. That is what is written literally into the Long-Term Care Act here in Ontario. We will be hearing, by the way, Andrew, reaction from several government ministers, uh, the health minister, the minister of long-term care, as well as the attorney general. They're set to do a news conference in just a few minutes. Megan, thank you. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick, live in Woodstock, Ontario. We have the latest now on the manhunt in northern Manitoba. The RCMP has returned the focus of the search to hundreds of square kilometres of bush and bog around the remote town of Gillam. That is where Cam McLeod and Briarsh Magelski...